Towards the end of June 1977, the Science and Engineering Research Council was given approval to build the world's most powerful pulsed neutron source at the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory. This source, ISIS as it's now called, generates short but very intense bursts of neutrons 50 times a second when protons from a particle accelerator hit a uranium target. Buildings that were basically suitable already existed, but extensive modifications were needed to the underground, ring-shaped hall destined to house the new accelerator. While this civil work was in progress, much was happening elsewhere at RAL and outside in industry to manufacture new components and refurbish existing ones for their new roles. Before we go much further with the story of the project, let's hear from a senior research worker, Dr Bruce Forsyth, why neutrons are of such interest. So what is so special about neutrons? Well, neutrons are one of the elementary building blocks of matter, and they can interact with atoms in various ways. The neutron carries no electric charge, so it can penetrate to the interior of atoms, interact with the nucleus and be scattered. Although the neutron is electrically neutral, it does carry a magnetic moment and this can interact with any uh, magnetic moments on atoms, giving rise to magnetic scattering. In common with other elementary particles, the neutron has certain wave-like properties. And for slow neutrons, the wavelength is of the same order as atomic diameters. The regular arrangement of atoms in crystals will therefore scatter neutrons into distinct patterns called diffraction patterns and these can be interpreted to reveal the arrangement of the atoms or of any magnetic moments. Unlike X-rays, slow neutrons have very low energies of the same order for example as that of a quantum of vibrational energy in a scattering sample. The interaction of phonons with neutrons therefore gives rise to very large and easily measured energy changes so that the dynamics of solids and liquids may be studied. The neutron is therefore a unique tool for a wide range of studies in physics, chemistry and biology. In the accelerator, particles from a hydrogen ion source are given an initial kick by a 665 kilovolt generator. They're then passed through focusing magnets into a linear accelerator, where they receive impulses from radio frequency fields between very carefully aligned copper drift tubes. After this stage, the ions have an energy of 70 million electron volts and are travelling at about a third of the speed of light. The main synchrotron uses powerful electromagnets to bend protons derived from the injected ions into a circular orbit. Production of the high-precision laminated magnet yokes presented industry with a significant challenge. Water-cooled copper windings carry an energising current of many hundreds of amps around the magnet yokes. Great care was taken with the machine-applied insulation and hand operations to ensure the long life of the completed magnets. At all stages of the manufacturing processes, careful checks were carried out to make certain the magnets would conform to the stringent requirements. Trial assemblies were made to ensure perfect mating of the various parts, and the final magnet pole profiles measured carefully. Because the magnetic fields in the synchrotron bending and focusing magnets cycle 50 times a second, Non-conducting ceramic has to be used for the high vacuum tube through which the protons circulate. It's only possible to produce short lengths of the high quality alumina ceramic required. 
techniques were developed at RAL to join the precision ground pieces manufactured outside into the longer lengths required. The process involved stacking pieces, which had a thin coating of glass at each end, into the required lengths, and then fusing them together in a furnace. The result was a beautifully strong vacuum-tight tube, true to within a millimetre over several metres length. Both straight chambers for the focusing magnets and curved ones for the bending magnets were produced in this way. The curved vacuum chambers have to be inserted into completed bending magnets, so they have large diameter vacuum flanges at one end only. The vacuum chambers have to be positioned and supported in the bending magnets with only one millimetre clearance between the chamber and the magnet poles. Although the use of a ceramic vacuum chamber solves some problems, it introduces others. The proton beam must be cheated into believing it's travelling in a metal tube. This is achieved by the use of a radio frequency shield made of stainless steel side plates with wires top and bottom, all supported by frames made from Macor, a recently developed glass ceramic material. The shields were one of the most difficult design problems encountered. Insertion of the five metre long assembly into the vacuum chamber also wasn't easy. In addition to bending magnets, the synchrotron has quadrupole focusing magnets to control the width and height of the proton beam. Vital magnet parameters had to be measured relative to geometrical survey points on each magnet. When all of the quadrupoles had been measured, they could be assembled onto concrete bases, with the magnets resting on special kinematic supports to allow subsequent alignment. The two quadrupoles and two trim quadrupoles that make up each of the ten focusing assemblies used in the synchrotron were then carefully aligned. All of the quadrupoles were designed so that they could be split and accurately reassembled to allow easy insertion of the straight vacuum vessel into the complete focusing assembly. By now, modifications to the old buildings had been completed and the synchrotron room was ready to receive the new machine. David Gray, the project leader, formally placed the first component, a complete focusing assembly, onto its adjustable jacks. The protons circulating in the synchrotron are given 12 kicks each time they complete a lap. Tuned radio frequency cavities are used to produce these kicks. Because of their special nature and complexity, the cavities were assembled at RAL from components made in industry. A number of special components were required. Here we see ceramic to metal seals being prepared and tested. They're welded together with other components to form the central vacuum tube of the cavities. The circulating protons are accelerated by radio frequency fields set up across these ceramic insulators. Special assembly jigs were needed to ensure proper alignment of the central tube as it was fed into the other parts of the cavity. The addition of a few components completed the cavity ready for use. As time went by, more and more components were placed in the synchrotron room and careful alignment checks made. Although the synchrotron is over 50 metres in diameter, components have to be positioned to one-tenth of a millimetre, about the thickness of a human hair. In addition to the main synchrotron ring, the injection line coupling it to the 70 MeV injector was started. 
During this time too, the operation of remote position controls was checked. To provide the ultra-high vacuum required for the proton beam, a few million millionths of an atmosphere, special pumps are needed. Soon it was possible to complete the injection line, the vacuum pipe surrounded by magnets that takes the ions from the 70 MeV injector to the synchrotron. Other focusing magnets and beam measuring devices followed. The last item to be put into the synchrotron before tests could start was the stripper foil, which has the job of stripping electrons from the injected ions to produce protons. It's extraordinarily thin, only about a quarter of a micron or a thousandth of a millimeter. To make matters even more difficult, it has to have one of its long edges unsupported. After the protons have completed 10,000 circuits in the synchrotron, they've been accelerated to 800 MeV and are travelling at over two-thirds the speed of light. They can then be extracted and taken by an overhead beamline out of the synchrotron room. On leaving the synchrotron room, the protons travel along a beam line over a hundred meters long to the target station where neutrons are finally produced. To make it safe for people to work in the hall through which the proton beam passes, two metres of shielding are needed. Here, RAL cut up and machined the steel from the old Nimrod accelerator, which previously occupied the buildings. The target station is one of the most demanding parts of the whole installation because of the high levels of radiation involved. Large solid steel wedges are used to provide shielding and to act as guides for massive neutron beamline shutters. To ensure absolute safety, the neutron producing target and other potentially hazardous components are contained within a stainless steel vessel over 15 millimeters thick. This was built to the highest standards of the nuclear industry. The vessel has 18 ports through which neutrons pass to the researchers and an entry window for the 800 MeV protons. The top of the vessel is completed with a stepped plug, also of stainless steel, and later filled with concrete. Because of these special requirements, the vessel, weighing 12 tonnes, was made in industry. Its installation required great care. Once the vessel was in place, the remaining wedges could be installed and the 22-tonne neutron shutters lowered into their guides. The shutters are suspended from solid steel top wedges and actuated by screw jacks. The manufacture of the uranium target plates posed many problems which industry helped solve. Depleted uranium, alloyed with small amounts of other metals, was first cast into suitably sized billets under vacuum. From these billets, the actual target plates were machined and clad in cans made of a special alloy called zircaloy. The two parts of the cans were placed in a jig. Then welded together by an electron beam process. It's absolutely vital that the uranium and zircaloy form a metallurgical bond. 
This was achieved in a special press at high temperature. After careful visual inspection, the plates were subjected to ultrasonic scanning underwater to test the quality of the bonding. Despite initial failures, fully satisfactory results were achieved. To facilitate mounting, the plates were fitted into stainless steel frames and then machined to provide cooling channels. Final assembly of the target proper involved stacking discs of various thicknesses. Unless steps were taken to prevent it, many of the hard-won neutrons would be lost. A reflector consisting of a mosaic of beryllium rods and located around the target increases the number of neutrons that reach the moderators. When fitted later, these moderators slow down the neutrons to the energies required by the researchers. During use, the target and adjacent components become intensely radioactive and all servicing has to be carried out with remote manipulators. To ensure that all of the required operations can be performed satisfactorily in this way, final assembly of the target, reflector and moderators was carried out remotely. Bursts of neutrons pass along evacuated tubes to various spectrometers. By measuring the time of arrival of a neutron at the detector, the speed of each neutron can be measured. This is the basis of the time of flight technique which is used for all the spectrometers. The longer the flight path, the higher the resolution achievable. The high resolution powder diffractometer is situated outside the main experimental hall, 100 meters away from the target. The neutrons are conducted along a guide tube which works exactly like an optical light guide. The glass tube was made in one meter lengths, here being carefully checked for optical quality, which were then accurately aligned end to end inside a vacuum vessel. Slow neutrons emerging from the guide are scattered by the sample backwards onto the detector, this geometry ensuring the highest possible resolution. To study motions of atoms in specimens, the change in neutron energy on scattering must be measured. This spectrometer, called IRIS, was built in India and uses beryllium filters for this purpose. The magnetic moment of the neutron enables a beam to be polarized and information about a specimen can be obtained by measuring how this polarization changes on scattering. A special low temperature filter is used to polarize the beam. Another instrument is designed to utilize the intense fluxes of neutrons with energies of several electron volts, a unique feature of pulsed neutron sources. The intense beams generated by ICES have required new detector systems to be developed. Each element on this detector was made from a separate neutron scintillator tile, with each tile connected optically to a bank of photomultipliers by flexible fibre optics. A detector based on this principle is used in the low Q instrument. The distribution of neutrons scattered at small forward angles from a sample gives information about its structure. A wide range of materials, including biological ones, can be studied. In the time of flight technique, every detected neutron must be labelled with its flight time from the moderator. A comprehensive computing and electronic data acquisition system has been installed to serve the experimental facilities, enabling rapid assessment of data to be made. What will access to the world's most intense pulsed neutron source mean to the research workers? Let's look to the future with Professor Alan Ledbetter, Head of Neutron Division at Rutherford Appleton Laboratory. The operation of ISIS will bring enormous opportunities to scientists from a very wide range of disciplines and backgrounds. 
This is so, firstly, because of the unique and ubiquitous nature of the neutron as a probe of the structure of matter and of the way in which atoms and molecules move in solids and liquids, and hence of the forces holding these atoms and molecules together. It is so, secondly, because on ISIS we have new instrumentation which is carefully optimized for the most efficient utilization of the intense short pulses of neutrons which it produces. Some of the initial set of instruments has been shown on this film and these will already give a very broad coverage of scientific and technical applications. From high resolution structural studies of crystals, glasses and liquids to determination of the large-scale structures of colloidal and biological systems, and from fast molecular vibrations and high-energy magnetic fluctuations to the relatively slow diffusive motion of atoms and molecules in condensed matter. However, we are already beginning to plan new instruments to further extend the range of scientific coverage. Let me give three examples. First, an instrument which will give a complete diffraction pattern from a single pulse of the machine, so enabling us to follow structural changes resulting from stress or chemical reaction in successive time intervals of one fiftieth of a second. Next, a spectrometer for measuring the structures of solid and liquid surfaces by glancing angle reflectivity measurements. And third, a method of measuring non-invasively temperature profiles in operating gas turbine engines. This is of crucial importance to increasing their efficiency and performance. Here, the temperature is measured from the width of the energy-specific absorption of neutrons by particular nuclei, in principle enabling a three-dimensional temperature map of engine components to be determined. For the longer term future, we have begun to think of ways of improving the performance of ISIS even further. Firstly, we can improve the neutron yield by using a target of enriched uranium. Then, we could construct a completely new second target station using buildings which already exist. This would take one fifth or one tenth of the proton pulses, but produce five or ten times more neutrons per pulse by using a subcritical booster target, which would probably be optimized for cold neutrons. And thirdly, we might increase the proton current by constructing a completely new higher energy injection system. Now, which of these developments we actually pursue must depend upon operating experience. But it is quite clear that ISIS has such enormous potential that it will remain in the very forefront of research activity until well into the next century.